Among the many types of amphibious craft that this war has brought forth, one of the most successfully employed has been the LCI-L, Landing Craft Infantry Large. Battles are won by men. It's the LCI's job to get the men there. From the Mediterranean to the South Pacific to the English Channel, fighting men have poured down their ramps by the thousands. And in the landings to come, there'll be even more of them, as many more as we can build. So let's take a look at them and see what they're like. Statistically, they are ocean-going landing craft, 158 feet long, with a 23-foot beam and displacing approximately 380 tons at maximum full load in ocean-going condition. She is the speediest of all landing craft, being powered by two quads of General Motors 671 units, which develop a total of 1,800 horsepower. Her separate propeller shafts revolve in opposite directions, and the variable pitch propellers give her a speed in excess of 15 knots, with a cruising speed of 13 knots. She is not only fast, but highly maneuverable, as you can see by this tight turn. Her flat bottom construction gives her a very shallow draft. At beaching condition, she draws only five feet two inches aft, and two feet, 10 inches forward. This is the main deck looking aft from the forecastle. Above her main deck, there's a gun deck. On that, the pilot house, and over that, the conning station. For loading and unloading, this type of LCI carries two ramps outboard of the hull at the bow. These are designed primarily for personnel and small package cargo capable of being manhandled. The ramps are controlled by cables leading to a winch in the forecastle, which is operated by the winch man. Outside, there is a clutch man for each ramp. As soon as the ship beaches, the ramps are led out and dropped, either together or singly, as they work independent of each other. The other basic type LCI is identical in construction, except that it has a single ramp carried inboard, allowing more deck space forward of the conning station. This type has bow doors, and inside them a watertight door, both of which are operated by hand block and tackle. The bow doors are opened when approaching the beach, and a watertight door either on the approach or after the ship is beached, depending upon surf or combat conditions. Then the single ramp, which is operated by a winch on the main deck, is run out for the landing. The ship's personnel consists of 25 men and three officers but a fourth officer is sometimes added. The commanding officer is usually a Lieutenant J.G., and in addition to being responsible for the running of the ship, he has as additional duties navigation, training, and morale. If there's no fourth officer aboard, he also handles the ship's communications. The executive officer, usually an ensign, is in charge of the deck division, supply, gunnery, welfare, maintenance, upkeep, and personnel. The engineering officer, also usually an ensign, has charge of the engineering division, repairs, damage control, and commissary. This is the interior of one of the troop compartments. In addition to the ship's personnel, the LCI can sleep and feed approximately 206 troop officers and men in four troop compartments and one officer's compartment. When loaded with its full complement of troops, five tons of cargo can also be carried. But when empty of troops and with the bunks secured, she can carry 75 tons of packaged cargo in the troop compartments below the main deck. Here we see food and ammunition being brought aboard. No cargo may be stored on deck except in case of extreme emergency, as it puts the weight too high in the ship. To maintain adequate stability, the cargo should be stowed as low as possible in the troop holes and lashed down securely before the ship puts to sea. However, the primary purpose of the LCI, the one she was designed for, is to carry combat troops to an enemy beach. When they are transported directly from the forward area to the area to be attacked, they can be loaded directly from the dock or from the beach, whichever is the most convenient. Troops may also be transferred from a transport somewhere near the area to be attacked for the run into the beach. LCIs are often called on to do this after they have discharged their original load of troops. 
Upon boarding ship, the troops should be directed to their quarters below immediately to keep the decks clear. There's a rifle rack over each bunk, which you'll notice the man on the right using. The LCI is not a heavily armored vessel. Her armor consists of one quarter inch steel hull, treated quarter inch steel around the conning station, the pilot house, and around each of the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Her armament is primarily for anti-aircraft protection and also, if necessary, to protect her own section of the beachhead by strafing to neutralize light enemy opposition. But before we show you the armament, we'll call the crew to general quarters so the guns will be manned. If you please, Skipper. All hands take their battle stations. However, regardless of where their battle station may be, men on watch at key positions must not leave to go to their general quarter stations until they are relieved. In the pilot house, the helmsman gives the course to his relief. The same procedure is followed in the engine room as the men on watch there are relieved. And now let's take a look at the guns. The ship carries a total of five 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Number one gun is located on the forecastle. At general quarters, a fire hose is led to it and to all the other guns. Numbers two and three guns are on either side of the gun deck forward of the conning station. Guns number four and five are in the same position on the gun deck aft of the conning station. There is no director fire control on the LCI. Each gun has its local control sector with the communications officer in charge of guns number two and three forward of the con on the gun deck and the engineering officer in charge of guns number four and five aft of the conning station. There being no officer forward by gun number one, it is commanded by the gun crew captain. All the guns are controlled by megaphoned orders from the conning station. These orders are supplemented by telephone connection through talkers. In this way, the target or targets may be selected by the executive officer in the conning station, who is in a position to receive direct orders from the skipper and also has the best overall vantage point from which to keep an eye on all the guns. Or local control may be left to the officers on deck, whichever is desired. That is the fire control setup for general quarters when the ship is not preparing to beach and all hands are available on the guns. And now we will show you some of the fundamental tactical uses of this type of ship. Here is a division of LCIs loaded with troops proceeding in column formation. And here is a squadron of unidentified planes looking for trouble. As soon as the planes are sighted, the division commander orders a prearranged emergency signal run up. The hoist is repeated by the other ships. Being an emergency signal, it's executed as soon as understood by the following ships. For outside of their own firepower, the LCIs must depend upon evasive tactics for protection against attack. To make this protection most effective, certain basic evasive maneuvers have been worked out. Here is one of the most commonly used. From column formation, all ships go flank speed ahead. The first section turning hard right to form a circle with approximately 600 yards distance between ships, while the second section turns hard left to form a similar circle. Each ship is then free to maneuver as it sees fit within the circumference of the main circle. The advantages of this maneuver are obvious. For one thing, the ships are dispersed as targets and don't present a straight line for a strafing run. Also, it's hard for a dive bomber to make a bombing run on a circling ship. You won't see anybody shot down here because these planes happen to be ours. And this is just a practice maneuver, but what you're seeing here will be handy to know out in combat areas when the chips are down. From this formation, the firepower of the whole division can be brought to bear against the attacking planes, forming a heavier concentration of fire than if the ships were deployed individually. This is a standard evasive maneuver. However, each flotilla commander may develop similar tactics appropriate to his combat area. 
When the attack is over, the ships are in such a position as to be able to form up in column again immediately on signal from the OTC. As we said earlier, the primary purpose of the LCI is to land combat troops on an enemy beach. To do this with the most speed and safety for all concerned, there are certain commonly used beaching formations. Of these, the most frequently used is the Division V. At a point approximately 30 minutes from the beach, the officer in tactical command orders the prepare to beach signal hoisted. Upon receiving the signal, each skipper calls over the voice tube for beaching stations. And in the pilot house, the switch is thrown to sound the signal. From the conning station, the executive officer passes the word to secure from general quarters and take beaching stations. At condition one mic, gun crews are skeletonized, the beaching stations having first priority. Numbers four and five guns are left with a pointer for each gun and one loader for the pair. Number one gun loses one member of its crew, leaving only a pointer and a loader. The ramp check line man, who is really in a hurry here, bends the ramp check line on the bits so that the ramp may be paid out slowly. Changes in station are kept at a minimum so that the guns are still manned during the transition from general quarters. The able flag is broken out. Cat heads are rigged for beaching. The stern winch is uncovered and the engineering officer dons the headset at his station in charge of the stern anchor detail. The communications officer leaves his station on the gun deck and handles the phones on the conning station, checking with the engineering officer at the stern anchor and the exec who is in charge of the ramp party forward. He then passes the word to the skipper that all stations report manned and ready. Numbers two and three guns are also skeletonized with each gun manned only by a pointer and one loader between them. Word is also passed to the troops below to get into full combat gear preparatory to the beaching. And now, once committed to beaching action, the ship will not deviate from its course. In the event of air attack, evasive action will be waived and the direct run to the beach continued. When the division is about 2,000 yards out and on signal from the flag, they take their formation for beaching. To get into a division V from column formation, the guide ship proceeds straight ahead, while the even-numbered ships sheer out to port and the odd numbers to starboard to form up like this, each sector of the V in line of bearing on the flag. In action landings, it is best to stagger the lines so that enemy planes will not be able to make a strafing run down either line. In action landings, there will probably be a gunboat on each flank for protection, plus the protection afforded by our own 20 millimeters. They can also be used for beach strafing, although this should not be necessary as the LCIs will normally not land until immediate enemy opposition has been cleared. Nearing the beach, the stern anchor is let go outside the line of surf. One of the advantages of hitting the beach in the staggered formation is that it allows each troop load to disembark and deploy before the next load lands, thus keeping the beach clear of a possible troop jamma. And now let's look at a second formation commonly used in beaching. If the entire formation will not fit on the designated beach, the best solution is to split them up into the smallest practical operational units, which is section V's with three ships to each section. In this way, last minute instructions can be issued by the OTC to the section guides in case there should be a change in the operational order as to what beach is to be hit and at what time. In other words, each section may be operated independently of the other section or sections. This formation, like the first one we saw, also prevents troop congestion on the beach. Here is still another method of approach to an enemy beach. This is used frequently when surprise as to which section of the beach is to be hit is a desired factor. In this maneuver, the ships make their run in column formation parallel to the beach. Then, when the column is directly opposite the beach to be attacked and on signal from the flag, the ships make a simultaneous 90-degree turn toward shore. 
This formation brings all the ships on the beach at the same time and requires a beach wide enough so that ships may beach at least 100 yards apart. As this formation lands all the troops at once, it is used only when the tactical situation makes this factor desirable. Even though the LCI has a very shallow draft, variable surf conditions and possible sandbars will make some of the landings wet ones. During this period, the ship keeps her stern anchor cable taut, and if necessary, to keep her bow straight on the beach, she goes ahead on her engines. As with any other landing craft, the LCI is most vulnerable to attack when it's beached. It therefore retracts as quickly as possible, and once clear of the beach, with the primary mission complete, the ships form up again for further duty. Yes, the LCI-L is one of the handiest ships in amphibious warfare. She has plenty of speed and maneuverability. She can be used to evacuate casualties from the beach, to shuttle reinforcements of men, and carry supplies and ammunition between bases or beaches. In short, she can handle just about any job that calls for a dependable, seaworthy, maneuverable workhorse.